Welcome to this episode of the Dojo. Um, my name is Grandmaster Ray Such. Uh, I just wanted to let you know a little bit about our show if you haven't watched it before. It's the open door to the martial arts, martial arts tournaments, uh, master and grandmaster interviews, competitors, coaches, school interviews, point tournaments, grappling tournaments, a little bit about everything. And in this episode, again, we have more footage from the King Cobra Karate Martial Arts Open that was held in Erie, Pennsylvania uh, this year. So you, we're gonna have uh, team competition. More footage from the uh, team competition. We're gonna have bladed weapons and weapon competition, which are, uh, you know, whether we call them, uh, you're Japanese and call them uh, katas, weapon katas, uh, hyungs if you're in Korean, but they're basically form competition. You're also, you know, we'll have the minute of self-defense and a lot of other things. But we started off with our interviews. We have two coaches from Great Britain. Uh, the, first co or the first coach we'll be interviewing today is from Wales. And then there is a separate coach for England. So it's a dual coaching on the team. The representatives, the individuals come from both parts of the UK. So here's the first interview with the coach from Wales. This is Christina Michelle with the Dojo, and we're still here at the King Cobra Karate Martial Arts Championships. And right now, I'm talking with Master Eddie Malinowski, who is the head coach for the Great Britain team. So thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for asking me for this interview. If you can start off, just tell us a little bit about yourself and who you are in the martial arts. Uh, myself, I've been involved in the martial arts now for over 40 years. I'm a 60 degree black belt. I'm a member of the Welsh Karate governing body. I'm from Wales in the um, United Kingdom and I've brought over a team that's mixed up from Welsh and English fighters as part of the United Kingdom team that uh, came over to compete in a three-way international between Canada, the USA and ourselves. And how many years have you been participating in this particular event? In this particular event I've been coming back in four years since 1986. Uh, I first came over to compete in an international myself in Canada uh, in an Arnie Russo's tournament. We competed there and actually came down on the Sunday to compete, or Saturday to compete in Master John Barton's tournament. I'd never met Master Barton till that day. Uh, we, we've made an instant friendship and since then, as they say, we've uh, competed over the years. They've uh, come over to the UK and competed against us and we've traveled here numerous times to compete against them. And what style do you teach in the martial arts? I, I teach freestyle karate now. My background is from uh, Lauga Karate. I also moved into Wadaru Karate, but now I teach freestyle. And what age ranges do you work My with? age range goes from four years up. How do you select the students that come and compete in this event? Is it something that they can sign up for or you choose which it, students it, it, It's a bit of both. It, it's, um, it goes on the students who are able to compete at this level and who are looking for that experience. But it, it also goes along with how much uh, we can raise to assist those students who can't afford the uh, cost of traveling. So it's a little bit of both. And what is it like for a lot of these kids that are coming over uh, and they've never... It, it's an amazing experience. Um, they, they see a lot of the USA on television, Disney Channel. They see these karate studios on the sides of the streets in malls, etc. Because we don't have anything like that uh, back in the UK. There are, f there are a few full-time dojos, but the ma majority of uh, martial arts is taught in leisure centres, community centres, and the use of halls on a part-time basis. So for them to come over and experience that, it's a massive experience. Uh, the size of the tournaments, uh, again, uh, this is one of the larger ones, I'm told, but and the impression that they get from the amount of competitors, the range of what the competitors do as regards self-defence, weapons, Basically, in the UK, it's mostly forms and uh, fighting. I think we allow a little bit more contact than you do over here, so sometimes that uh, trips us up. But, um, yeah, it's just a massive experience, and each and every fighter that goes back, whatever their grade or experience, when they go back to the club, they're, they're a different student. And that brings a lot back into the club and makes other students eager to get that experience as well. Because they bring back what they learn. They, they, not only that, they, they bring back um, it's, it's strange to, a, a confidence which they didn't have previously. And also, even just traveling gives you that experience. You, you, know, right. you must learn how to use an airport, you must learn how to sort of 
look out for your gate, look out for your boarding pass. They, they, they've got to learn to look after themselves a little bit as well. So uh, it becomes a good experience in life all around. And how many are with your team this year? I have brought out um, a party this year of uh, 29 people and out of those 29 there are 17 competitors. Um, because some of the youngsters uh, have to be chaperoned by parents, so right. one or two parents have come along, but even they have to be part of the squad and part of what they're doing, so they, they're driving, they're assisting, they're making sure that they're in hotel rooms, they're making sure where they are on time, and they're always making sure that the group is, is there together and is, is move, moves around together. Now, as far as the difference between martial arts here in the U.S. and in the U.K., like you said, there aren't as many full-time dojos, so how did you decide to get into the martial arts? And Well, I, I came around after the old great Bruce Lee era, uh, era like everybody else, and right. um, signed up in the 70s, as I say, to Kung Fu, came to Swansea in, in Wales, where I'm living, and I've always fancied doing something, so I thought, right, okay, let's go along. Um, a friend of mine and myself went along, we signed up that night, there was over 400 people signed up that night because it, it was the rage at the time and I think most probably out of the 400 and the several hundred that came afterwards, if there are three of us still training actually, training and teaching, that would be it. And what does the martial arts mean to you? It basically, it, it, it's a means of, uh, uh, it's, it's become a way of life, it's, it's um, not only a self-defense aspect, it, it, it teaches, as you say, punctuality. I have to turn up for classes. Students have to be right. there on a certain time. Um, you have to give up a lot. Um, I suppose in, in my younger days when I was actually competing, and there were a lot of tournaments then in the uh, UK, so we would be competing on a regular basis, weekly. And uh, so my wife and children suffered a lot, but uh, she now gained the benefits because she now travels with me wherever I go over the world. So, uh, so she gets pay, the free it's trips. Pay, it's payback time, yeah. Right. Yeah, yeah. And... What would be your biggest piece of advice for students getting into the tournament scene, having done this since 1986, you said, um, yeah. at, this at, at this specific tournament? Um, it, 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 it's basically in, ensuring that you are aware of the rules of a tournament you, that you are going to and competing with those rules. Right. It's, it's pointless saying, oh, we do this back home, or we allow this, or we don't do that. If that's the rules of the tournament of the country that you're competing in, that's what the referees are looking for. You give the referees what they're looking for. And hopefully they come back on your side for that. And of course, it's giving respect to everybody. I mean, you never blame, if your competitor beats you, don't blame the competitor. If, he has, if he's had a decision, even if you dispute it, it's not his fault. You can blame the referees later, but uh, right. no, as you say, it's, 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 it's respecting pe people and learning sort of to believe in yourself believe in and what you can do and, and have fighting. that confidence and say yeah I can do that I can do this and it's um, I think martial arts is a is a sort of unique aspect of that type of a sport because although you train in a group you travel in a group but when you go out in that area you're totally on your own right and you can have a coach behind you and that but it's, it's you out there so it becomes down in the end to you against somebody else and, and it's, so you must believe in yourself that's some great advice. And Thank is there you. anywhere that um, our viewers can find out more about yourself or your school? Do you have a website, anything like that? Um, we're on Facebook with Morrison Freestyle Karate Club, so they can find us about that. Um, they, we're also sort of mentioned with the Welsh Karate Governing Body, WKAGB Limited, which is on the uh, website for Welsh Karate, which is a traditional um, governing body. But they govern all sort of martial arts in Wales, make sure everybody's licensed, that uh, everything's right. carried out as it should do. And... Uh, there. All right, great. Is there okay. anything else you'd like to add before we wrap it up? Well, no, I'd just like to thank you for this interview. Again, we're not very, um, let's say, uh, how can I say, um, oh, used to doing these interviews, as you can tell perhaps from uh, the repertoire, but uh, thank you very much. And, uh, I and hope thank you for joining us. Yeah, thank you. Thanks. Keep watching, and we'll be right back with more on the dojo. Admit it. You're the one who killed him. You seduced him, gained his confidence. And then when he wasn't looking, you reached into your purse and without conscience or remorse, you pulled out a gun and shot him. And cut. Curious? Visit theindiegathering.com, a film festival, and so much more.
Welcome back. Now you're going to see team competition footage. There were three teams, uh, Great Britain, Canada, and the United States. So, you know, you're, you're, you're not having individuals compete, you're having them compete as a team. So by age or by rank, by height, they're matched up and continuous points and these points accumulate for each of the teams for overall team winners. So let's take a look at some of that footage of team competition. These are the last bouts between Great Britain and the United States. Again, you got to remember, it, out of five judges, one center referee and four corners, it must take three to call a point. Great Britain point. Great Britain point. Great Britain point. Not enough. Not enough. Now we're getting into a little bit more of the adult fighting. Great Britain point. Great Britain point. Great Britain point. U.S. point. Not enough. Again, when two people score at the same time, it is called a clash. No point is given. One must be before the other. Great Britain point. Great Britain point. U.S. point. Point U.S. U.S. point. Point U.S. 
There's a point for Great Britain. Great Britain again. Great Britain point. These are the last fights of Great Britain and the U.S. The U.S. goes on to win, and in our next two shows, you will see the U.S. against Canada. Great Britain with a hook kick to the head. U.S. with a hook kick to the head. Uh, some great fighting going on, and... Uh, you know, it, it's just watching all ages, uh, you know, you, and again, by rank. You can be watching adult black belts fight like black belts, but you're watching children fight like black belts uh, also, and very, very informative on their uh, different approaches in fighting. Some are attack, some are defensive. And uh, stay with us. We'll be right back. Are you a filmmaker looking for the location of your next project? Contact the North Coast Film Commission. With small cities throughout Ohio, we're here to help with your film, television, and commercial productions. With low to no cost permits and locations, we'll help stretch your budget. From our production resources to our talent database, we will show you just what the North Coast has to offer. Visit northcoastfilmcommission.com today. Welcome back. I'm Grandmaster Ray Such, and you're watching the dojo. Our next segment is going to be in the ring. This is where weekly I do a uh, segment on how to obtain a point, uh, take your opponent down in grappling, uh, how to win at weapons competition or empty hand competition. Today we're going to use um, a technique that is called a grab and point. Most of the time, individuals don't grab and they shun away from it. And, sh and, and grabbing for the sake of grabbing with no points scored is frowned upon. But I'll show you a way to grab and point, uh, get a point, and it's instantaneous. So let's check this out. It's in the ring. Welcome to this segment of in the ring. You know, I, I cover everything, how to get points, um, we're going to be doing some where into the uh, self-defense and the uh, grappling, those kind of things also. This particular segment, you know, you, you go to a point tournament to um, compete. The one thing they're going to tell you is, you know, not to grab legs. You, you grab legs, you know, and, and hold on to a leg or that, uh, the person can easily fall and hurt themselves. So they'll tell you no grabbing. 
okay? Contrary, you know, whereas in the grappling, that's what you're doing your best at is grabbing. Well, in this particular segment, we're going to show you how to get a point and grab and get away with it, okay? First of all, again, the, uh, if he were to kick up to me and I grab the leg and I go to punch him or that, I could get a point, but he's going to fall. They might object to it. But in the guard, when you go to grabbing and attacking, uh, I also want to say you, you never, uh, if his guard was up, you don't grab somebody. You grab somebody, you can miss. Okay? First of all, this is going to be a grab and attack. And what you're going to do is you're going to take your hand, your open hand, hitting the back, the side of his arm. Okay? When you hit the side of his arm, matter of fact, there's going to be parts to this and we'll put it all together. You don't grab, you hit. You then roll your hand. Now watch, I'm going to be closing two fingers onto his arm and squeezing. So when I slide down, the wrist stops the grab. So what I have here, again, is a hit, pressing with a roll, closing two fingers and sliding down his wrist. All in one smooth movement. The next thing is, once you get to the wrist, you just don't want to move the hand to the side. You want to not only move the hand, but throw your, uh, your partner a little bit off balance. So when you do that, when you do the hit and the roll, of course you're going to be attacking, but right now I'm just talking about this part of the technique. You're going to take his hand and pull it down to about a foot to the uh, one foot, 12 inches to the side of your foot, which throws him off balance. Not just pushing him to the side or twisting him, but pushing, uh, pulling him right down there where you straighten out your arm. So now you have a slap, a roll, the closing of two fingers, a slide to the wrist while you pull down here to one foot to the side of your uh, front leg. Okay. Now, it's going to be totally obvious what to do next. And not to do it next, but to do it at the same time. While you're doing this, and you begin to do this, you have your fist set. And when he goes off balance, you just automatically have your technique right into the ribs. So again, this is done a little bit together. So as you're doing it, you have it. It forces him into stepping. It opens up his ribs and you have it. You may also want to use the ridge hand. And that is, when you're going here and that, you're dropping your hand and going to the side of his head, back of his head with your ridge. Again, make sure they're allowing contact because sometimes even with a helmet, if you touch the helmet, it's same as touching skin. Most of the times you can touch the helmet. So this automatically gets you your point. So again, never turn. Just, just move it. Press, close your fingers, pull, bang. That is how you grab, pull, and strike at the same time without missing. Missing, if it's his uniform, you grab his uniform, whatever. <coughs> it doesn't matter if you've got his uniform because you're closing on the arm, sliding down to the wrist, and the wrist stops the pull so you don't lose him. Okay, and again, we're going to do one low, and we're going to do one high. And it tilts his body, so the other arm is being taken away from you, so it'll be easy to get. And this is how you get away with grabbing and attacking. To grab and not do technique, they're going to fr frown upon that. This way you do a grab, you definitely get technique. And we'll be looking for you next time in the ring. And now we have an interview with a youngster from Great Britain. And 
I love working with kids in, in the school, and I love to talk to kids out in, and Christina has really got this young competitor who's traveled across the ocean to come here in the U.S. for the first time in his life to compete. So here's that interview. This is Christina Michelle with the dojo, and we're still here at the King Cobra Karate Martial Arts Championships. And I'm talking with one of the competitors from the U.K., Joseph Edwards. Thanks for joining us, Joseph. Thank you. Now I see you've got some great trophies here. Can you tell us what you competed in and what you won? Uh, I came second place in the sparring kar karate, um, and it was under nines and tens. And they won the kata third place in under nines and tens. And where are you from in the UK? You're from Wales. Yeah. And your instructor is Eddie, Eddie Malinowski, right? Yep, yep, that's him. Now, is this your first time here in America? Yes, yeah. And what's the experience been like for you coming over here and competing at a big tournament? Amazing. It's really, um, it's really good meeting all the different kinds of people, and the, the Canadians and the Americans are really good. So. Um, now, were you nervous at all competing? I know you said you competed a little bit before, but... Uh, a little bit, but not much. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. I, I was, I'm just glad, to be honest. How long have you been in the martial arts? Um, about a year and a half now. And what do you study? Um, I'm a blue belt, and uh, that's the... Uh, the sixth... Um, belt in the karate and I st study all different kinds of moves and different kinds of what's what's your favorite the katas or the sparring 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 and what do you think is important when you get into the ring and you're ready to spar uh, you look for you look concentrate um, look at your opponent 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 and keep your guard up as well so. All right, well, congratulations on your awards today. Are you all done competing for the day? Yep, that's it. All right, well, good job. Thanks for talking with us. Thank you. <laughs> Keep watching, and we'll be right back with more on the dojo. This August, come to the film festival where East meets West. It's an incredible showcase of over 75 films from around the world. And it's more than just a film festival. It's a place where filmmakers can gather together with the audience for one amazing weekend. To celebrate the power, the drama, the joy, the magic of independent film. The Indie Gathering International Film Festival. It's so much more than you ever imagined. Welcome to Movie Outline 3, your first step to a successful screenplay. Movie Outline is powerful screenplay development software for both the amateur and the professional screenwriter, which uses the simple technique of step outlining to build your story, characters, and screenplay scene by scene. With Movie Outline, you can easily plan and customize your story structure, color code acts, rearrange scenes, develop and track characters, format your screenplay, and compare your own story to successful Hollywood movies. Movie Outline is the ultimate writer's tool. Visit www.movieoutline.com to download the free demo today. Welcome back, and now we're going to go into the interview with the coach from England. Again, he's the second coach for Great Britain. One was Wales, which we saw. Now this one is for England, and here's that interview. This is Christina Michelle with the Dojo here at the King Cobra Karate Martial Arts Championships, and right now I'm talking with another one of the coaches from the UK team, Lloyd Allen. Thanks for joining us. Thank you. If you can start off, just tell us a little bit about who you are in the martial arts and what you do. 
Well, at present, I'm the um, senior instructor for the Bristol Lago Kung Fu Club in England, and I'm also part of the uh, Great Britain squad. We also help select teams to represent England and so on. And um, my club alone in England, we've got at least something like 20 world or European champions. That's great. And how long have you been in the martial arts? I've been martial arts for the best part of um, 38 years now. I've been fighting as well as coaching. And do you still fight? I still compete in certain tournaments, but um, I'm mostly Focus on, the coaching. On, on the coaching side this time. Yep. Now, how do you select what students are going to represent England in the different tournaments? Well, we have various tournaments in our areas, and basically the winners from each section, we usually give them like a ranking points, and basically we can look at the um, points result at the end of the season and select our fighters through that system. And how long have you been involved in doing that? Over 20 years, in, in actually, a, a bit of the Great Britain team. Now, for the UK at this tournament this year, it's a joint team between yourself and Eddie Malinowski from that's, Wales. That's right, yeah. How did you partner up and decide to get involved with this tournament? Well, me and Eddie have been coming across here for quite a long time, and obviously it made more sense if we both can join both teams together, train together and come across as one team rather than coming as individual. So as far as the training together, how do you do you what have we, students go back and forth yes. between the schools? What we tend to do is we have um, certain, so we train once a month together as a team. Both teams, either Eddie's team will come to my dojos or I come to his dojo alternately. And then basically we select the fighters from there in order to represent the um, UK in the end. And is that the biggest thing you focus on is fighting with your students? Or do they also they learn the katas and that, but do you focus on having um, them compete in that as well? We do. We, well, I personally, personally, I teach not just the fighting. I do the syllabus stuff. I teach weapons as, as well as nunchucks and swords and stick sets. But... I do like my fighting, so obviously I tend to emphasize a little bit more on the fighting side. Right. And how do you select what tournaments to go to? Is that something that you decide or the others that are choosing uh, the students to represent the country? It's majority of the time it's me who make the decision which, which tournament to go to. I try and select the top tournament to try and go to because a lot of my fighters they're looking for the incentive to get better and the only way you're going to get better is to be fighting the best. So I tend to try and go the better, the further away it is we can go out and experience different fighting and try and promote our club in that sense and gain more experience rather than just staying local and winning local. So we'd like the experience of traveling and competing against other people. So would you say that that's how you think your students do well is by, you know, experiencing other styles of fighting? Is that important to you as far as competing is against other styles and other places? Yes, I think that is one of the main factors because, again, if you fight the same people all the time, you're basically doing the same consistency. Right. And it's good to see variation because no matter what standard you are, you can learn from different style of fighting and combine that when you go back. There's always more to learn each time. Now, as both a competitor and a coach, what would you say is the biggest thing that fighters need to focus on when they're competing? Well, basically, they need to be confident in whatever they're going to do. If they're gonna, whatever technique they decide to do, if they're a punchers or a kicker, they've got to be confident in what they're doing. So what we try and do, basically, is uh, the more competition they go to, they get more relaxed, and then the more they're relaxed, they can focus, and they can, um, they, they can pull it off a lot easier. Because um, a lot of times people, they travel and they get tense and they know that they can fight a lot better. But what we try to do is to try and give them a little bit more self-confidence before they get into the ring so we know that they can perform good. Because at the end of the day, we don't want them to travel thousands of miles away and feel embarrassed. So we try and let them feel as confident as we can when they go away. So if you have a student that you feel, you know, doubts themselves when it comes to competing, mm -hmm. would you try to hold them back from competing for a while until they have that confidence? Or would you allow them to, you know, go in, they may lose, 
and learn the lesson the hard way. Yes. To me, I'd only select the student if I know they got the potential of getting there. And obviously, the first time entering a tournament abroad, I would also allow for them to, um, if they're a bit nervous, and then gain by a bit more experience in that sense. But I would never take somebody there who I think who I've got the confidence to do that. Sometimes watching your student train, you know their ability that they can perform, and sometimes they could be a little bit rusty when they go away. So you, you allow for that, and you know they will shine in the end. And what countries have you gone to with your students and for competing um, in tournaments? We also go to the Irish Open Championships in Dublin, and that's the first first month. Sorry, first of um, March, first weekend in March, and uh, we've been going there for years as well. And with that one, it's one of the biggest tournaments on the circuit as well. So the students get a chance to fight various countries. Sometimes we have over 130 different countries taking part. About how many students do you have total, and about how many of them are competitors? Um, we've, in Bristol, we've got over 200 students, and basically a lot of them take part in competition. They love competition, they love fighting, because a lot of their um, senior instructors that's helped me coaching in Bristol, they're all either world champions or European champions, and they just love fighting. So we try and encourage that with the students to participate in as many tournaments as possible. Now, one thing when I spoke with Eddie Malinowski earlier, he was saying that he felt that the UK allows more contact than the US. Have you found that as well, that it's lighter contact here? Again, because I've, I've entered so many tournaments, I'm used to adapting to whichever rules they want. But it is, in a sense, we do contact a bit more in England. Would you say it's, that's difficult for some of your students because they're used to more um, contact or do they adapt well? I think my students adapt quite well because a lot of time you can s enter the tournament, see the type of contact. If it's, too, if it's too light or too whatever, you can adjust to it. And a right. good fighter can easily adjust to whichever. They just, they're there to fight and they'll fight anyone. Whatever rules there is, we can adapt to that. Now, is there anywhere we can find out about your group and your school and a website, anything like that? We, we have got a website, and um, again, I'm on the Lloyd Allen website, and basically on there you can get all my email info and um, my training sessions and everything else about me. All right. <laughs> all right, great, thank you. Is there anything else you'd like to add before we wrap it up? Yes, I'd just like to say a good thanks to um, John Barton for inviting us over here. I, we've been coming over here for quite a while now and we, we love the tournaments. It's a great atmosphere, everybody's loved it, we get on well. The Americans, they look after us every time and we can't thank them enough. Thank That's great. Much. Well, thank you so much for talking with us. Thank you. Keep watching and we'll be right back with more on the dojo. In today's world, there is an absolute need to know how to protect yourself. But who has the time or money for lengthy training sessions with techniques you may not remember in a time of need or which can wind up putting you in even more danger? With Escape and Survive, you will learn effective, easy to remember techniques for getting out of dangerous situations. No complicated moves, no expensive, time-consuming training. Just common sense, self-defense. Book your seminar today at escapeandsurvive.com. Cleveland Academy for Self-Defense is Northeast Ohio's premier martial arts school. Located on Cleveland's near west side, we teach several martial arts disciplines specializing in Taekwondo and Hapkido. As taught by Master Ray Such, students of Cleveland Academy learn discipline, formal martial arts training, and real-world self-defense techniques. Classes are available for children and adults. Cleveland Academy for Self-Defense, the home of champions. Now we're going to change the pace for you. We're going to go to kata, weapons kata. And in this particular segment, you're going to see black belt men's with bladed weapons. And again, 
You know, students out there that do weapons competition, I cannot stress hard enough the fact that a weapon is not judged as a weapon alone. It is an extension of your body, so your stances, your balance, your blocks and strikes, your empty hand techniques along with the weapon count also. So here we go, and this is Bladed Weapons Black Belt Men's Competition. Here you're going to see Bladed Weapons Form Competition Black Belt Division. Uh, of the three weapons that are going to use, the first one here are size. Basically, Japanese Okinawan weapon. Again, you got to remember, back in the ancient days of, of Japan, uh, traditional weapons were banned by the use of the farmers or the peasants and that, and they had to take farm implements and turn them into weapons. And these are called the sai. Again, you, you watch the difficulty of the weapon, the use of the weapon, the movement of the weapon. Also the stances and the blocks of the individual. This particular practitioner studies Kempo. Now this bladed weapon are called Kama. It's a sickle type weapon used again in the Japanese Okinawan styles. And again, you can see that he's also judged by his stances and his kicks in the weapons form. Everything must come together in a weapons form. Kicks, strikes, blocks, stances, and the use of the weapon. Now this particular weapon was sharp, seems shorter than should be because it, I would say it falls into what is called the Chinese broadsword. This particular weapon seems to be a little shorter. Of course the broadsword is a Chinese weapon.
And those are the three bladed weapons today. You can see the control of the weapon. It's not necessarily a risky weapon to use. You have complete control on it at all times. I hope you enjoyed the weapons competition uh, because there's a lot of variations. Now we're going to go into Christina Michelle's Minute of Self-Defense. And this one's, ex you need to watch because for the female, it is the weapon of a key, using a key. So many people use a key improperly. And this is the way to effectively stop your opponent using a key. Take it away, Christina. Hi, I'm Christina Michelle. This is common sense self-defense. And using your common sense, your freedom is the first issue. Using a key as a weapon is simple and effective. Line the flat side of your key against your index finger with the base of the key gripped between your thumb and middle finger. In a slashing motion, you can now use the key against a grab or as a counterattack on an attacker. The face and neck are good targets as they're exposed skin. But you have to act quickly for this to work, so try not to hesitate. And don't try to push or stab. All strikes are slicing motions. Now you can effectively use this everyday weapon to defend yourself. So what you do is execute the technique, obtain your freedom, and flee, and get help. I want to express that we need you to uh, contact us here at the uh, dojo. You can email us at info at realtvnetwork.com, right across your screen. And let us know about tournaments you might have coming up. Let us know about your instructor, your school, your style. All information will be gladly taken. We can make arrangements to have interviews done for uh, the school and that, and if possible, we'll cover your event. So until the next show, keep kicking, and I'll see you then.